So here we are with another new season of anime. And well, I think it's time we got into it. We're about six episodes into the most series, so by now I'm pretty sure a lot of you know what you like, what you don't like, but I want to give my opinion on what I think is good and what isn't good. Or at least what I think is good. Anyway, if my voice sounds a bit weird, please forgive me. The reason it's also is delayed because of this. It's spring where I live at the moment and I have sinus issues, so you know, it's a lot of snot, coughing, sneezing, etc., struggling to breathe. But I guess that's enough about my health issues and almost being in a dead like state. Let's talk about more important things, like anime. So the first anime up is Iro Manga Sensei. Here's an interesting one. I kind of have a guilty pleasure in the or emo anime. Or my little sister can't be this cute. And since this is a work by the same writer, I checked out the manga. Not the original light novel, but the manga adaptation of the original light novel. And so here's now an anime of the light novel. So let's talk about the plot. Masamune Izumi lives alongside his not related younger sister. And as well as he makes a living as a mediocre light novel writer, struggling to get his next book published. He also quickly discovers that his younger sister, Sagiri, is his illustrator, also known as the titular Iro Manga Sensei. Learning this, he resolves his efforts to try and get his little sister out of her room, as well as redoubling his efforts to make a grand light novel that will get an anime adaptation for him and his sister to watch. Along the way, he meets other, other rival writers, each with their own motivation and love for the medium, as well as potential waifu baby, because this is that kind of franchise, baby. All the while, we have while following his dream of getting his series turned to an anime. So, why do I like this one so much? Well, I have to admit, it's the comedy. Despite this plot, one thing I do love about your manga, I mean, or emo, was the comedic work. And that's also here in Stride as well. Aside from that, the girls are cute, I like the art style, and it's a somewhat entertaining, somewhat meta story considering this was originally a light novel written about writing light novels. So it's like a video game about making video games, or a manga about making manga, etc, etc, etc. Is this as good as Bakuman? Oh hell no, Bakuman's a lot better, but I do have to admit this is also pretty intriguing. Next up is Clockwork Planet. So this is one that I'm also familiar with the manga of, but I didn't think it was popular until it turned to an anime. I mean, it's a decent manga, but I didn't think it would even get a 12 episode anime series, or at least get that popular, especially considering how late the releases for the manga chapters are. Of course, it's our scan late we're talking about. So, let's get to that plot. The planet has officially died about damn time, and the only way to revive it is to basically build on top of that in the titular clockwork planet in some steampunkish fantasy world. Now, Tomiura is an odd one with a love of all things clockwork. And after a coffin containing a high sophisticated robot falls into his house, he fixes it and finds himself wrapped up in a hidden plot about the end of the world and more robot girls. One thing I will say I do like about this series is Naoto himself. He's a total nut job, screwball with the love of all things clockwork and he falls in love with the sound of gears. The only reason he falls in love with the robotic girls is because of their highly specific, specific mechanization. It's sound of crazy, and it makes him a gigantic kind of pervert. I have to admit, I do like that kind of character. Overall, this is one that might end up being dropped after some time, but at least it's an interesting watch and interesting series to look at visually. I mean, I do like the whole spinning gear motif that everything has going for it. So it's at least a visually interesting series, even if not narratively so. So, next up is Love Tyrant. Here we have another love comedy harem anime. But this one's very meta, if that makes any sense. I know Seiji is an average teenager, of course, who, after Cupid dresses a Grim Reaper, of course, accidentally writes his name in a kiss note. It looks exactly like how you're thinking about it. Again, it's a death note joke, everybody. He ends up, which is a magical pairing notebook, he gets paired, he has to get paired off with someone or die quickly. Thankfully, he has someone he likes, and she likes him back. However, his crush, Hayama Akane, is also a complete yandere, who will kill him and anyone else in her way of, in, uh, her, way of her idealized relationship with Seiji. Guri, the angel, 
Slash the Reaper, also writes herself into the pairing, making it a harem, mainly because Seiji at night is a sparkle within her, as he tries to defend her from Akane, who stabs her in the head, thus making this a love harem triangle. Also, Seiji also added to the mix is Akane's younger sister slash cousin, it makes sense in the story, who's in love with Akane, but the story will have some feelings for Seiji. Also, there's another one of Akane's cousins who gets wrapped up in a plot and some weird powers that each of the family members have, as well as some odd family issues. And this is a 12 episode series, I wonder how they're going to get all of this done. I mean, I'm still reading a manga and most of this stuff has been wrapped up except for this patient about why these family has this weird power. But, yeah. So why do I like this one? Mainly the characters. Like any good love harem, the main plot is just an excuse for the characters to run around doing crazy stuff. And I have to admit, Economy's Yandere Act is played for pure comedy gold. And this is one of the very few examples I can think of where Yandere is played off comedically instead of dramatically. Also, her pairing with Guri is at least somewhat interesting in terms of the comedic effect the two have against each other. But Guri's nonchalant attitudes and Akane is constantly trying to kill her. Seijin sells a pretty decent character, bland as all hells for standard harem protagonist. And adding in the and adding in the weird younger sister bit is interesting as well, even if even if the character herself comes off as pretty straightforward. Overall, it's just a fun series with some pretty interesting characters, and honestly speaking, that's all it needs to be. So here we have Recreators, and this is one I just love for its concept alone. The plot's a bit confusing to speak in the words, but long story short, fictional characters are brought into the real world from their fictional worlds, each with their individual goals, seeking to try and use this realm of the gods, as they call our world, or at least the anime's version of Japan, and their own means of perfecting their worlds or getting revenge on their respective creators. Honestly, I've always loved the concept of fictional beings ending up coming into the real world and interacting with the people who created them. I know it's kind of weird, but I do love it. I love it every time it shows up. I love the episode of the original Spider-Man cartoon, the 90s Spider-Man cartoon, where Spider-Man travels to the real world and meets Stan Lee. And then it's just a fun concept. And the story has a bit of ice, and the story is pretty interesting with some pretty interesting designs all mismashing together. Which is just icing on the cake, and you know, I love the genre blending thing this thing has going for it. This was completely original, and I'm actually happy about that, as we'll be getting a hefty 22 episodes look into this very fun concept. And again, I just love it for its concept alone, but... Everything about it, speaking of being somewhat interesting, so might as well go for the ride. So we have this season's winner of the Why Isn't This Just Hentai Award. And Sen Nanatsu no Taizai are Sin and the Seven Deadly Sins. Okay... The basic plot involves a female Lucifer being thrown to hell. And from there, she ends up losing a battle against the Seven Deadly Sins, even though she's supposed to be one of the sins that she represents pride, but in this case, pride is replaced by Vanity. Interesting. I mean, Vanity was one of the original sins, but it got replaced by pride later on, so that's what they're going with. Anyway, she loses, turns to a demon completely, and escapes the real world for some reason. Honestly, I have no idea what's going on in this plot, as the series seems to mostly focus on lesbians having almost sex. I mean, like, so close to sex, I wonder why they're just not boning. Like, it reminds me a lot of Valkyrie Drive Mermaid in that regard. Although I'm pretty sure in Valkyrie Drive Mermaid they're actually having sex. Anyway, basically speaking, a single episode cannot go about without meeting our miss, our friend Mr. Sensor Bar, who is ever-present and vigilant in his work. Honestly, this is probably one you should probably wait for the uncensored version to come out, but seriously, someone who wanted this to be hentai and just dumbed it down to be an anime. It's obviously where the main focus is. Come on, people, you know what you want to do here. So, next up we have Alice and Zoruku. 
or Zoroko. I have no idea how to pronounce this correctly. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about the pronunciations. I'll apologize a hundred times, damn it. No, oh, this one is an out of place feeling anime. I mean, yes, it's an anime, yes, it's original, and yes, I mean, it's not original, but yes, it's a, a selling season, but you get what I mean by it doesn't feel in place with regular anime. Maybe it's the art style, maybe it's the mood the piece sets, but it doesn't even feel like a typical size of life for it half the time. I guess I'll go over the plot to ease it all. A young girl named Sana escapes from a mysterious research facility where she was being experimented on due to her mysterious power as almost the Alice's dream. She ends up encountering a young an old man named Zoroku, again forgive me per, if I pronounced that wrong, who begrudgingly takes her in and from there I have no idea. The first few episodes focus more on a slice of life set up with Alice, with Sana and Zoroku, and Zoroku's granddaughter. There's a lot of character stuff going on, especially with the granddaughter and like, you know, how she accepted her parents' deaths, at least in the second episode, as well as Sana getting used to the outside world. But I'm gonna say the most interesting part about it all is seeing this no-nonsense old guy helping a racist of power girl. Honestly speaking, I do like child hearing shows, if only to see older anime characters. And seeing an old ass guy be a main character is at least interesting enough for my for me, who's used to seeing a bunch of teenagers running around doing shit. And yeah, that's pretty much it. It's a pretty fun looking series and I honestly can't wait to see where it goes. I kinda hope it doesn't go full action show. I kinda want to stay a bit more slice of life. But with this whole subplot of an evil organization running around, I'm pretty sure I have to deal with that eventually. And finally, we come to Sugu Momo. And this is an odd but interesting one. The plot follows Kazuya Kagami, who takes care of Dapey Loves his deceased mother's Obi. For those of you who don't know, an Obi is basically a sash wrapped around a kimono to keep it together. Uh, one day, the Obi comes to life as Kiriha. Uh, for your pronunciations again, Suku Mogami. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a yokai born of a tool or an object that's been taken care of over the ages. You know, you're jumping umbrellas with eyes and whatnot. With other Suku Mogami appearing all over the town, Kazuya and Kiriha have to defeat the malicious uh, Suku Mogami. Why oh, did I write that so many times in the script? and protect the land for the god of the land. All the while Kazuya deals with the various women who almost assault him on a daily basis leading to a lot of fan service. Honestly, the reason this is here on the list, I like the manga. Like, the manga is also off light, but it gets really raunchy later on than the almost near sex that Kazuya keeps getting himself wrapped into. And the kind of sex he has and he's a six-year-old, it's weird. But, honestly, this is only going to be 12 episodes, so I doubt it's going to get to the more interesting bits of the manga, which involves more of Kazuya's mother and the situation with the gods. But, hey, this whole episode of the Suku Mogami of the week is at least somewhat interesting, as it leads to a variety of different opponents for Kazuya to come up against as he struggles to learn his powers. Also, cute girls were a thing. So, let's get on to a new segment here. The Season 2 Corner. So, why have this one upon this to shout out new original anime and says Season 2's? Well, honestly, there are a lot of Season 2's out there, especially this season. And I just want to talk about a few of them. At least a few that I believe deserve a special mention. So, let's, without further ado, get onto this little mini list. Attack on Titan Season 2. This is one of the two reasons that this part of the list exists. I mean, it's the second season of Attack on Titan, and it promises to give us some of the answers to the questions we've had since last season. Uh, it's sad that this is only going to be 12 episodes, so I doubt we'll be getting to a lot of the more interesting bits in the manga. But we'll at least be getting to some major reveals, some of which have already happened by the time we release this episode, sorry to say. But there's still plenty more reveals to happen, especially the great big reveal when we get to the... Oh, can't talk about that. Spoilers. Anyway, My Hero Academy Season 2. This is the other reason this segment exists. I was disappointed that the last season just kind of ended, 
I mean, it wasn't. I mean, the season wasn't my favorite anime of the year list, but again, I was just sad that it ended so abruptly with this 12 episode run. But now we're back, and it's getting proper judges with a promising 25 episodes. And it starts off with an interesting arc, starting off with the sports festival arc. And, well, I'm happy to see the 25 episodes. It means we'll be getting to the Hero Killer Stain arc, maybe we'll be getting to the final exam arc as well. Although, I think the summer camp arc will have to wait for season 3 if we ever get that. And again, I'm just happy to see more of My Hero Academy, and I'm kind of happy that we don't have to deal with a lot of filler like Naruto or One Piece and Bleach. Yeah, some of the filler in those series are decent, but I honestly think this series, at least the way the characters are written, works so well that it doesn't need filler at all. Baruto. I was conflicted as to whether this deserves to be its own entry as a recommendation or deserves to be in this you know, sequel corner. But as I kept thinking about it, I remembered that this thing has Naruto Next Generation in its title and I just kind of placed it in a slot. Honestly, I'm curious to see where this is going to go, as I have seen the movie and find that Gilly Sparto's character to be pretty interesting, at least in comparison to his father's. I also find the mystery of the series and the manga set up in the first few, pa- first few minutes and the first few chapters interesting as well. Now my only hope is that it doesn't go over the movie chapters. Yes, the manga started going over the movie chapters as well, and it's just recently gunning off all that stuff. And the anime is taking place before the movie, before Bartos even in the Ninja Academy, as the, as the anime seems to be going over his time in the Ninja Academy. But they both have the same cold open, and I hope that the I hope that this whole Ninja Academy stuff actually goes somewhere and isn't just building up stuff so that the anime doesn't have to start on the movie. Also, I hope we actually skip over the movie bits, but you know, I can hope, but hoping doesn't help sometimes. Ugh. I'm thinking way too hard about the series for a Naruto sequel, aren't I? Sonic Kano or How to Raise a Boring Girlfriend Season 2. This is another guilty pleasure. It checks all the boxes that annoy me in rom com anime. A somewhat uninteresting main character, girls who are crushing on the main character so hard, and a main character who can't seem to pick up the hand of girls are crushing on them, even though one is like five minutes away from dragging him to the back room and raping him. You think I'm joking, but I'm not. But I just find myself enjoying this, if only for the meta jokes about the bunch of anime otaku making the video game, or the various otaku jokes, or the character designs. Again, if you make cute enough girls, I will watch anything, won't I? Berserk, 2017. Okay, I know the anime is just a disappointment, but they're kind of a little bit better with this, guys. And it's still Berserk, so it's still at least pretty cool to look at, even if it isn't the exact Berserk art style. So, yeah, that's a ton of anime this season to watch, and a few interesting new works. Well, let's just see what they have for the rest of this year. So, till next time, everybody.